It's next my real pleasure to introduce somebody that we love working with in the research park. Mark Moran has become one of these people that inspires us at the research park to think differently, to push our thinking as a corporate leader and our innovation in terms of technology in new areas that continue to evolve and iterate at their center, the John Deere Technology Innovation Center. Now, Mark leads this team with humble and yet incredibly gifted leadership, and he encourages his students and his team to think about what the future of farming will be. And it's Mark that is thinking about new cool areas like robotics that he'll share with you today, machine learning, artificial intelligence, mobile, user experience that will change the way that they interact with their customers and that hopefully that they can cultivate more food to feed the world. Mark joins us with also multiple degrees from multiple institutions, but if you talk, talk to Mark, he'll probably proudly boast just one. If you're here at the University of Illinois, he wears his orange and blue a lot. And he also is paying it forward to students as he teaches as an adjunct faculty member at the iSchool while simultaneously, because he hasn't done enough, go back and getting his own PhD here at the iSchool to add to his own background and continued expertise. He's been with John Deere for 21 years, and we're really pleased to have him here today to share his perspective. So please join me in welcoming Mark Moran. Appropriately in your orange. Right on. <laughs> I said the same Mark. of you. Yeah. <laughs> Give me just one moment to pull up my slide deck. Uh, one of the side effects of having a job and uh, uh, going to school and teaching sometimes is you finish things at the last minute. So, one moment. All right. All right, we're in there. Great morning. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, Laura's absolutely right. Uh, I've graduated from a couple of places, but I'm an Illini at heart for sure. So it's uh, coming back to Champaign is coming home for me. Really, really briefly, uh, I want to try and cover a lot of ground. I want to try and paint a pretty big picture today that sets a context for what we do here in, in Champaign at the university and, and, and in Research Park and, and of course at Deere. We're going to talk a little bit about enterprise transformation. You get to do that when you're a part of a company that's 182 years old. You have to do it a few times. We're going to talk a little bit about agriculture. I don't think we um, think enough about how much it's changed, how, how very different it is from just a little more than a century ago. Talk a little bit about some technologies called general purpose technologies. There's been a couple dozen over the last 10,000 years that have really just been game changers. A little about AI. And then we'll kind of tie all those things back together. It's, it's going to be a lot pretty quickly, and, and hopefully it'll come together. Um, I, I love that, that picture of a combine. I think most people that aren't in ag, if they think about farming, that's uh, kind of their view of it. That's a, that's a piece of uh, deer marketing literature. Um, those of you that uh, know anything about ag know that it's really much more like, uh, hang on, slides are getting ahead of me. Oh, okay. <laughs> good, good, great, good, okay. Th those of you that are connected to ag know that really this is, is a lot more where equipment is today, right? This is a half million dollar, 625 horsepower uh, uh, factory on wheels that drives itself. Uh, Deer boasts uh, largest uh, fleet of self-driving equipment out of any company. And it knows where it is within about three centimeters. That's a stunning amount of technology to get that done, right? Um, that, and, and we do that because that's what we all must do to continue to feed the world. The, the, the demand for food continues to grow. And, and that's really, the, uh, that's really the, the grand challenge that drives, I think, many of us in this room, is the, is, the, is the realization that for the world to continue to flourish, we have to about double the food supply in the first half of this century. And at the same time, we have to about double the urban population. That's a lot of work, and, uh, it, and I think it's for deer and for, for many companies in this sector, it's, it's that, that fundamental contribution to make the world a better place that gets us excited. A um, couple of disclaimers. The opinions I'm going to share today are, are mine. I don't, I wouldn't say I necessarily speak for deer on all things. I'm influenced by what I see at deer, and if I do a good job, I influence deer as well, but these are my opinions. 
I'm certainly an Illini. I don't apologize for that bias, but I do acknowledge it. Uh, Fox's law, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So stay up at that high level today and, and let's, let's talk in generalities and don't get hung up in the details. In general, if I have a data source, if I have data that I don't uh, source otherwise, it's from the USDA. And there's a lot of pieces to this story. So we'll, put, we'll pick up some ideas, set them down, and then put them back together before we're all done. Uh, briefly about our team here in Champaign, Laura listed a lot of the great things we do. We've been here since 2008. You know, we're one of the 25 or 30 ag tech companies here. Um, and I think it's really, really appropriate to be doing ag tech here in Research Park. You know, the university's motto is learning and labor, and that's fully on display here at the south end of campus. That's absolutely what all of us do in our innovation centers every day. I think of the 2,200 or so employees in the park, about 800 of them are students, so we make some great opportunities. Professor Davis referenced the Morrill Act. Brief quote from it, because I think it's so relevant to what we do here. This bill proposes to establish at least one college in every state upon a sure and perpetual foundation, accessible to all, but especially to the sons of toil, where agriculture, the foundation of all present and future prosperity, may look for troops of earnest friends at last elevating it to that higher level where it may fearlessly invoke comparison with the most advanced standards of the world. That's what we do here at Illinois for sure, and, and certainly here in the park. Now Illinois is a Midwestern university and it's too humble to brag about itself. I will brag about this place since not all of you are from here. Illinois is preeminent, huge, innovative, and interdisciplinary. Illinois is good, great, or best in the world at all kinds of things that matter to big companies. Uh, Illinois' College of Engineering, a top five program, is as large as the other four combined. Illinois does very well when compared to, Illinois grads do very well when compared to other schools as innovators in terms of involvement with unicorns, serial entrepreneurs, female founders, uh, uh, successful exits, uh, very, very successful. And Illinois is distinctly interdisciplinary. And if maybe I wanted to think about what was different from when I was an undergrad a long, long time ago, I think that's one of the biggest changes here. The university has learned to work across boundaries very effectively. I think at the heart of that is being number one in NSF founding for NSF funding for I think the last six years. That participating in those those big ideas forces the university to work across boundaries. So that's manifested in uh, you know the coordinated sciences lab. Beckman Institute, NCSA, Institute for Genomic Biology, and even uh, in uh, student programs like Hef t and m Illinois Business Consulting, and the C CS plus X degrees. One of the other things I love about Illinois is although it's 150 years old and celebrated that great birthday, it hasn't stood still and it hasn't stopped reinventing itself. They announced the intent to open the, the Data Science Institute uh, with a set of uh, X plus data science degrees. Uh, there's a new Center for Autonomy, there's the new Siebel Center for Design, and a new medical school, which is going to take a distinctively engineering bent towards problems. All right, enough about that. At 182 years old, as the OG of ag tech, we, get to, we know a little bit about transformation. Um, we are uh, a very rare and very unusual company, and so maybe one way, one way to think about that is can you name me another company that's been number one in their core business globally for over half a century? It's pretty special. It's not common. And, and that's worth noting. I also have to acknowledge that's not all good, right? If other people don't do it, it's, a natu it's not a natural state. So I think we've had to be pretty introspective about what it takes to stay on top for so long. Another way to think about deer being kind of unusual, there's about 4,000 publicly traded companies on the, on the major markets in the U.S. Only 20 of those are older than deer. That's a half a percent. And out of those, none of them are industrials. So at that long age, I, I think it's fair to say, by my count, we've had to reboot ourselves about five different times to become really substantially different from what we were before. In the 1870s, we had to think differently about how we would develop our channel, and we established our dealer network, which looks a lot like it does today. In 1910, after a string of acquisitions in the couple of decades before, we came to a modern corporate structure. We also got into the tractor business. That turned out to be a good idea. In the 1960s, we decided to become a much more global company, decided to focus on advanced technology leadership. 
In the 2000s, we realized we needed a much more robust business model, and uh, we focused on precision ag, accelerator, globalization. And now, as we just finish what I would have characterized as our fourth uh, transformation, we're settling into another here where the focus is really much more than just equipment, and it's really generating actionable insights that complement that equipment. <clears throat> Excuse me. When I talk about a reboot, I'm really talking about what an academic might call enterprise transformation, which is about big change. That's about either changing your business model or your business operations. And I'm not talking about your continuous improvement or your business process reengineering and strategic management. That's just the blocking and tackling we all have to do to survive. It's something bigger than that. Okay, we'll come back to that enterprise transformation idea in a little bit. I want to take a few minutes and talk about how much agriculture has changed in the last century or so. And it's in places like this with, with partnerships like Professor Davis articulated um, that, that, have, that have made change like that's possible. Read a quick quote for you from a, from a, uh, a, a book by Don Paulberg, who's a professor at Purdue and, and his son. If a farmer from Old Testament times could have visited an American farm in the year 1900, he would have recognized and had the skill to use most of the tools he saw. The hoe, the plow, the harrow, the rake. The changes that occurred in American agriculture during the 20th century exceeded the magnitude of all changes that had occurred during the previous 10,000 years. Think about that for, for a moment. That's the work that groups like us have done. Uh, Certainly deer, but certainly lots of other companies as well. I think if you want to start bucketing all that transformation into big buckets, you could say a big piece of it was industrialization, which is about the efficient use of power. A big piece of it was biotech, which is really about the increase of plant performance. And a big piece of it was infotech, which is really a bit about communication and, and, and now precision ag. Let's look a little bit more at each of those. Uh, industrialization is really about more efficient use of power and largely about less biological power. In the first half of the century, you see a complete switch from horses to tractors. And uh, tractors, based on an internal combustion engine, weren't the first use of an industrial power on the farm. Steam tractors go back to about 1855. But steam tractors were big and heavy and a hassle and slow to get started. Functionally, they did something the same, right? They tried to take power to where you wanted it, and they didn't eat your product, but they were a lot harder to work with. So it took a, it took a different way of thinking to make that happen. The uh, rural electrification in the early part of the 20th century primarily replaced uh, human labor on the farm. Put those things together, and you see the chart on the, on the right side there shows how the, the amount of work came crashing down on the farm the amount of work associated with, with everything that was done. Complete different, complete change in, in just a few decades. On the, the biotech front, uh, there's been so much that's happened in biotech, it's, it's really hard to boil it down to a slide. But just a couple things I'll highlight. One is the use of chemical fertilizers, you know, the green revolution in the 50s and 60s. Deer actually got into that business. For a few years, we had a fertilizer business. As, as we have many times in our past, we decided we liked equipment better. We, uh, sold, we sold out of that, but the, there was a, 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 in the 50s and 60s, huge change in the way we think about farming. At the same time, uh, genetic engineering has, uh, has, has changed the way the crops are, are able to adapt under a wide range of conditions. You put those two things together and you start to see across the course of the 20th century, you had three, four, five, six, seven times the yield in, in crops. Um, and then information communication technology, if you look at, it's not just the internet and it's not just mobile, it goes further back than that. If you look at the radio and you look at the telephone, those were both early tools to connect farmers to their markets much more efficiently. And I think if you look at that whole suite of tools, across that time period say that that's just information that lets you manage your operations from, from anywhere. And there's so much technology on equipments now that we are able to legitimately show up at Consumer Electronics Show with no sense of irony. We were, we were well welcomed. Those of you that have been in Champaign for a while will recognize uh, Julian, who led the center before me. I can't say he's my predecessor because no one can replace Julian. Um, and, and 
even five or ten years ago, the idea of an ag company showing up in a setting like that wouldn't have made sense, but that's how advanced the equipment is now. At the same time, there's been substantial demographic changes within agriculture. This, the chart on the left here shows the uh, amount of the population that's involved in farming now. At the beginning of the 20th century, about 40% of people in the U.S. were farmers. Now it's less than 2%. Farms have gotten bigger. Uh, not, there's a little more land than there was at the beginning of the, of the 20th century. There's less than there. Uh, I'm sorry, the land peaked in about the middle of the 20th century, and now there's a little less involved in farming compared to the other attributes that stayed pretty stable, but they've definitely consolidated. There's fewer farmers, and, and the farms are much bigger. That's not all good. There are challenges that come with that, but it's an amazing transformation. And if you want to boil all those stats together, all that change together, farm labor declined in the U.S. in absolute terms, not as a percentage of the population, but in absolute terms by about two-thirds over the course of the last hundred or so years, while the population increased by 350 percent. So the, at, it, while the labor decreased, the, the farm output increased over that same time period by about 700 percent, and food costs dropped in real terms by 50 percent. And if you, if you, the, the productivity of the U.S. economy is something we're very proud of, but if you look at farm productivity, it was about twice that of the rest of the economy over that same period. Ninety-three percent of farmers now have off-farm off income and U.S. farmers generate so much food that it's become a huge export business over the last hundred years. It's an amazing amount of change when you take it into totality and something we probably don't reflect on enough. So boil all that down, what are some common themes across all that? If you look at the internal combustion engine and electrification and computers and the internet and biotech, those would all be called general purpose technologies by economists. And, and uh, they're, they're part of a list of maybe a couple of dozen technologies that have really been the big game changers that have changed society over the last about 10,000 years. General purpose technologies are pervasive. They end up changing practically all the sectors of the economy. They're improving. They keep becoming better versions of themselves. They spawn other innovations. There's different types. They're products, processes, or organizations. They're often not immediately obvious. Sometimes it takes a little while to realize what's changing and they tend to reorganize the boundaries of industries. And if the change is too great, that can make it very hard for incumbents to survive. Talk a little bit more about electricity and computers. They're, they're good ones to look at because they created huge changes and they're largely in the rearview mirror. So we're able to, to look with a little perspective. Um, skip that one. Yeah, so if we look at elect electrification, in the, uh, in the early part of the 20th century and then IT in the late part of the 20th century. You can see that uh, patent activity and trademarks are up, up, up notably during those periods. That's kind of to substantiate the idea that n new knowledge, new ideas are created uh, through general purpose technologies. You also see a relationship between IPOs in industries that are tied to electrification on the left and computers on the right so that there's more activity around new companies being formed in uh, industries dominated or controlled by, by GPTs. Why are these general purpose technologies so disruptive to industries? Industries, on the whole, a pessimist would say most companies end up dying, right? You become aware of your corporate mortality at 182. So if you look at the, the, the chart on the left there, you've got eight or ten different industries that all take the same shape. That's the number of firms in each of those industries. Car makers, TVs, vacuum tubes, typewriters, transistors, multiprocessor supercomputers, calculators, integrated circuits. I've got the same chart for tractors, for all kinds of different industries. Companies are created, a dominant design emerges, and then the, the industries start to consolidate. And that, that picture looks something like this. And, and each one of these humps takes a different set of skills. And because we're deer, we see things in terms of tractors. That's how I'll tell this story. When the first internal combustion engine tractor was created in the 1890s, it didn't look quite like a tractor does today. If I showed you that picture, you would not be obviously sure that that's what, that was a tractor. 
By the 1920s, it was clearly a tractor. I have on the top there the, the Farmall, which is really the, the first tractor that fits kind of our modern notion, and then the GP, Deere's answer to it. To get from that first point on the chart to the second point on the chart, that's really about understanding what your customer wants. That's a focus on product. Over the next few decades, as, as the industry evolved in the US, yes, you still have to understand what the customer wants, but once that, once that design stabilizes, it becomes much more a focus on how do we make this thing as efficiently as possible. This point here, where that dominant design emerges, that's the peak on all these curves. Once the basis of competition changes, it becomes about being good at manufacturing and good at scale, and that's when industries consolidate from from dozens or hundreds down to just a few. And then at some point, everyone's making this thing about as well as you possibly can. And the focus becomes about different services that you can add on top of that. So now it's about business model innovation. It's about thinking differently about how you monetize your product service system. And it's much more about services. It's a different set of skills with each one of those. And, and learning how to pivot through those things is, is what's tough for companies. General purpose technologies are often what start that technological discontinuity there on, at, the, at the left of the chart. At the same time, if, you're, uh, if, you, if you have a, a, a company making a successful product, uh, you think you know your competitors are, but general purpose technologies can change those rules as well. Kind of the classic example is a traditional photo market where people thought the most important thing about photographs was the quality of the image. It turns out we don't care about the quality of the image. We care about how easy it is to share. So all of a sudden, really crappy pictures from mobile phones started to becoming more valuable than pictures taken with professional equipment. Why? Because you could share it easily. It turns out we were focused on the wrong thing. You could maybe argue within the ag sector, I've just got a, a few of the, the major parts of where farmers spend their dollars you know, charted out over the last 30 years for what percentage of that dollar we get. I'm not really in the equipment business, the information business. I'm really in the yield business, just like all the rest of you. And so sometimes you end up fighting the wrong fight. So you end up giving market share to companies that you didn't think of as your competitors. It's also another trend where, and this is Clay Christensen's work, uh, the, you know, the idea of the, uh, the innovator's dilemma, right? You get really good at something and eventually it's so good you're starting to overserve a part of your core market. And then a new company that makes what maybe you think of as an inferior product can start disrupting your market from below. I've charted some of the, just measuring by horsepower, some of the, uh, this, I think there's a, about 2,200 different tractor models reflected in this chart and you see newcomers to the U.S. market starting to climb their way up the market at the bottom. And again, they're attacking you with probably a different set of technologies. And all that happens in a context where business really is changing faster and faster and faster. So what's next in terms of general purpose technologies? You may have noticed on, this, on the list I showed uh, earlier, at the bottom of the list is artificial intelligence. And we're just starting to step into that era. So I want to talk a little bit more about that. Um, artificial, techno artificial intelligence is about learning patterns. And I'll, I'll say a little more about what I mean there. This is uh, Aikoff's uh, hierarchy of data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. The idea here is that they're, they're somewhat additive. And uh, data is just dealing with raw numbers. Computers have been really good at that for, for decades. In the last few decades, computers got really good at presenting that data as information, so we don't think about the data part anymore. It just automatically handles that. Knowledge traditionally has been where people started to have an advantage, and wisdom is, is certainly a place where, where we at least think we, we, have, uh, we have a hold on things. There's been a uh, kind of dividing line for a few decades with, where we just let the computers handle data and information, and we focused on the knowledge and the wisdom. Sometime in the last few years, our computers started getting a lot better at this knowledge part. A lot better. And if, if you want to start thinking about, you know, kind of different sorts of data science problems, maybe you could categorize them that way. And that predictive space, you know, pr if you can predict something, you've identified the pattern in it. That's where, really, when we talk about artificial intelligence or machine learning or deep learning, that's where we're really focused. AI is a... Uh, is a three-legged stool, I'm getting ahead of my slides here. 
But AI is not a, it's not a new idea. You know, the AI, go, the term goes back into the 50s, and it was a, that's a copy of the proposal for a, a summer institute at Dartmouth. You'll see Claude Sh Shannon uh, is the author of the proposal. Um, when we talk about AI, it's really made up of data processing and algorithms. And I think maybe you could say that that traditional approach to AI is a lot like that steam tractor I showed you earlier. It gets the job done, but it's big and it's bulky and it takes a little while to get started. And it can be a little bit hard to work with, but there's a lot of power there. In recent years, we've seen all of those things change very substantially. Data. The cloud has made storing any amount of data you want infinite, immediate, and elastic. GPUs have reinvigorated Moore's Law to the point where we're seeing faster advances in processing than we have in quite a while. And reinforcement learning is not exactly new, but it's become much easier. Uh, and it's, it's a new class of algorithms. I've got a screenshot there of uh, DeepMind, which got uh, freakishly good at a set of Atari games a few years ago and the only thing the computer was told is a high score is better and it learned everything else on its own through playing essentially. And that's very different and maybe you could say that this new approach, these new tools that contribute to artificial intelligence are a lot like the tractor. A, a much lighter weight, easier to work with, easier to deploy version than the, than the steam tractor that came before it. So will AI mean another revolution in ag? I think it's fair to say that, that Deere thinks yes. Um, uh, many of you may know we acquired a company called Blue River recently, and they are an, an AI company. What they do is, is pretty cool. They, uh, they've strapped what we would have traditionally thought of as a supercomputer to each row of a sprayer, and it very, very intelligently identifies weeds versus plants and sprays the weeds right there at that point uh, in real time very efficiently. So it's, it's less chemicals, it's the chemicals right where you need it. And it's, this is, these are those ideas that we talked about, about kind of new AI, right? The processing is right there on the edge and so you're able to, to cre create value from it immediately. I think it's important to say we've been doing AI and machine learning inside of Deer for a long, long time. But sometimes when you need a new capability, um, sometimes it's just easier to go get it and then figure out how to integrate it. Um, and, and so maybe in there, there's a lesson in corporate longevity. So now I'm going to try to tie all of this together here. So I talked about each of our five reboots over the last 182 years. And I think in each case, it's fair to say part of what drove that reboot was that we needed a new set of insights. And in, in all those cases, Deere actually went outside to, to help find those. In the 1870s, when we created our dealer network, um, we intentionally kept those dealers as separate companies because we wanted to have them with local market intelligence and be embedded in their communities. And that was a result of earlier experiments where the boundaries were a lot messier. We, we understood the value in having people who are focused on that local market. In the 1910s, that was after, that was at the tail end of a, an acquisitive spree there. And, uh, and bringing in all that external knowledge forced us to rethink of how we were structured. We also got into the tractor business, uh, which turned out to be a great acquisition. In the 1960s, we decided we wanted to globalize. When we went into Europe, we bought a German tractor company uh, to gain understanding of that local market. In the late 90s, and early 2000s, as we got serious about precision ag, as we started to understand the power of GPS, we acquired several companies. And as we got into new international markets, we also acquired companies uh, as, at, at the end of successful JVs. And then just a couple of years ago, we bought Blue River to accelerate our AI capabilities. So those external insights can be very, very important. Putting this all together, what I'd like you to take away from our time here this morning is Agriculture has, has been reinventing itself for over 100 years, uh, and it's been general purpose technologies that have done that. General purpose technologies displace products and reshape industries in, in ways that are not easy to see at the beginning. AI looks like it's going to be the next general purpose technology to revolutionize ag. More change is coming. We won't, we won't stand still for even a moment here. Existing companies have channels to customers, they've got scale with suppliers, they've got cheap and consistent capital, and those are things that are attractive to startups. 
And startups are built to get from idea to product really quickly. And sometimes when you get good at that other stuff, those things become hard. So the, just this quote here from our CEO in the 90s, Hans Becker, I think he called it pretty well. Nothing is likely to mean more to our future than how effectively we adapt information technology. And I don't know if I get to do this, but I think we have time for questions, if that's, if that's useful. And to put you all in a good mood, I'll close with some pictures of my dog, Fluffy. <laughs> Who I should note is also an Illini. Yeah. That's it. Questions? Thank you. in the room as well. Brave souls. Somebody who's with a startup that has customer discovery need for John Deere to answer, perhaps. Alex like is Shitsu's. always willing to give a question. Emeritus chemistry faculty member, be prepared for a chemistry question. <laughs> I did terribly in chemistry. In fact, that she did give a good lead in for the question, which is in your list of all of these revolutionary technologies, uh, maybe I'm too nearsighted to see, but measurement science didn't show up on there. The ability yeah. to characterize soils, to characterize materials, to characterize the great world, and therefore provide the basis for the information. Great, great comment. Great comment. So I completely agree with you. I, I felt like I wasn't in a position to to start editing uh, the list of general purpose technologies. I completely agree with your observation. I think broadly I'd, I'd put that in the, in the bucket of industrialization, or, uh, which was on the list, um, because it, you know, that, that the importance of kind of bringing statistical process control to the field, absolutely critical. We, we wouldn't have known where we were making gains elsewhere without it, without it. so I'm, I'm glad you, if that didn't come across, I'm glad you called that out. Great comment. Todd Gleason uh, from here on campus, University of Illinois Extension and WILL Radio. How, how do you see this being deployed on the farm exactly? So I understand maybe the, the artificial intelligence mm -hmm. in what you discussed would recognize a weed and be able to spray it, but certainly there's got to be more data driven there that will come back to the consumer some way or the John Deere will deploy in some other fashion. Yeah, good question. I think at, at the front end of big changes, it's often hard to tell exactly how it'll play out, so I'm not entirely sure. I think I would say more broadly, um, we've spent a lot of years automating all of the work, and, and we've still left farmers with a lot, a lot, a lot of tough decisions that they have to make in real time. And with equipment so large, and with farms so large, um, you know, this next wave, I think, should be tools that help make some of those, those things easier. What forms that takes all the way from raw inputs all the way out to the table, I think it impacts every step along the way. Um, I mean, if, if, if we take AI up to a high level and say it's really about pattern identification to enable actionable insights, whether that is an action that a user makes with more confidence or whether it's an action that's able to be made automatically like with my favorite robotic mower as Laura mentioned those are all those all fit into this so I, I, I think it's all of the above and I think it's too early to say with any specificity good question hi Connie Bowen and I'm with the yield lab um, I'm curious when we look at kind of John Deere and machinery, a lot of what comes up is things getting smaller and swarms and that sort of thing. Um, and I'm kind of curious to hear what your thoughts are on just kind of what, how you look at smaller things, because obviously, yeah, John Deere built big. Um, and yeah, and how that starts to incorporate with the kind of drones and the fleet yeah. type robotic systems. That's a great question. Yeah, we like big equipment for sure. Um, Part of why equipment has to be big is traditionally we're relying on, on this processor and this vision system to do most of the work. So when you only have one of these and one set of these, you really want to make that equipment do as one, much work as you possibly can. One of the things that I think is interesting about AI as it, as it starts to replicate more and more of the things that make our processor and our sensing system special then you can decouple yourself from the machine form. And you can start to think about things differently. 
to do, to do the swarm stuff, it's super cool, it's super evocative. It's also kind of a pain to manage a lot of little things. So it's not all good. Um, there's still going to be a place, you know, we've been, if, if you want to look at other general purpose technologies as kind of indications of how industries can unfold, mainframes are still doing really, really well. You know, meanwhile, we also still like to do things on our watches. So it turns out there's use cases for all of those. I think, if I had to guess how this will unfold, um, you know, for, for big fields, with well understood operations, getting through there once with a big piece of equipment is still a pretty efficient way to do that, especially as we continue to invest more and more in lighter materials. But for edge cases, whether that's an odd shaped field, a corner, a place where you've got to do some rework, maybe that's a place where other machine forms start to make sense. And it's something that I think us and all of our peers are certainly looking at. But we love the big stuff, there's no doubt about it. Other questions? Okay, great. I want to say thank you for your time this morning. And uh, I, know, I know there's going to be a, a, a great day ahead, and uh, I want to echo Laura's encouragements to, to make sure you make some new friends today, and, and uh, thanks for listening.